It's time for VRV8, Rising Voices 8, proudly sponsored by NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and Lichen Livelihoods Knowledge Exchange Network. Also, the Olohana Foundation, thanks to the courtesy of the Pierre and Pam Amidiar Foundation, the Hawaii Community Foundation, and Honor the Earth. Technical production by Lomi Kai Media. This show is hosted by none other than Heather Lazarus and Julie Maldonado. Special facilitation by Kyle Powers White. Help desk assistance by Mariah Ben Joseph. Technical and sequence editor Chris Schaefer. Produced by Julie M. Stowell. Directed by M. Kalani Sousa. What time is it? It's time to log on. Adjust your dials. Remember, you're not alone. So sit up, tune in, turn on. It's time for VRV8, Rising Voices 8. Aloha, everyone. Not only are we not alone, we have so much in common. You know, this is probably the first moment in a long time that the human race has everything in common. We're all under quarantine. Everybody's wondering what's going on. Nobody understands nothing. So speaking of commonality, all the old cultures understand the connectivity of life. And in every version of the culture there is a medicine wheel or something that applies to the four directions or the four seasonalities the four faces of womanhood these are all really lessons about the water cycle and the cycle of life so we thought we would start with our version one of our versions of that particular prayer. E tu e tu ate at the tai hotu. E tanalo e tanalo lau vilito. E lono he lono he ulu te me ai o te poyo no. E tani he tani tahi ta vai ta tu hivi. E luli luli ta po atu ate at the tai hotu. Amama, they are no one no item. So, those old prayers are present in all of our old societies, our old roots. And these old roots, they follow the old seasons. And so, welcome to the Phonology Network's special Rising Voices presentation. And we like to present and also thank Miss Heather Lazarus. Hi, you guys. Hi, I'm Paulette Blanchard. I'm a citizen of the Absentee Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma. I live in Little Axe, just outside of Norman, Oklahoma, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Kansas in Geography. I've been part of Rising Voices for eight, eight seven, eight years now, and um, as far as phonology, phonology has always been kind of a key indicator for me as a native person of when to plant, when we have ceremonies, when we can harvest, uh, when we can hunt, all these things, right? So um, in this past year, I've been working on my dissertation, but um, have had the opportunity to do some traveling and um, spend time with other indigenous people in their homelands. Uh, for me personally here in Oklahoma, though, We've been trying to, we, we grow a garden and we hunt every year. And this year with the COVID issue, the COVID um, pandemic, we've had to work a little harder to uh, be conscientious and intentional about planting our garden. One of the challenges was, is that it got really warm early. So things bloomed and then it got really cold and we had frost. So things were either had their growth stunted or had um, problems with the flowers freezing or uh, seedlings freezing or 
not growing very well or at all. So when things did finally start to grow in the outdoor garden, um, again, it, it rained heavily. We have these uh, intense downpours uh, where we can get an inch of rain in an hour. Uh, we also had, of course, the wind and the, um, the temperature extremes and the temperature swings, which are, are more normal. There's not a consistent weather pattern, nor is there a consistent temperature. Um, being in the continental, you know, in the center of the continental U.S., we do have that continental temperature extremes of of real warm or real cold that um, happen, but they seem to be more frequent. And uh, as far as our winter, we didn't have a frost long enough to really kill off some of the ticks, which here in my local area, there are three tick-borne diseases. Uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Lyme Disease, and Ehrlichia, which causes you to have an allergic reaction to red meats. So going out in the woods and collecting mushrooms or root plants is hazardous to your health, literally. Um, and then unpredictable at that, since the weather extremes, the temperature, the, uh, the humidity and precipitation all have to be a certain way for certain mushrooms and harvest and such for certain plants. And the weather extremes have caused certain plants not to bloom when they normally would. So that makes that challenge. Um, and as far as my garden, just when it started to grow, um, Oklahoma is known for our extreme weather, which is often con um, conflated with the, or coincided with the tornadoes. But the other big issue we have has been hail. I had hail just a couple of days ago that was golf ball size, uh, just a few miles down the road from us. They had tennis ball and baseball size. So when you have extreme hail events like that, you're talking about life, limb, and property. Um, so my plants, uh, most of them were fairly small, so they didn't seem to get too big beat up. My flowers that I plant for the bees and hummingbirds got a little beat up. But um, what it's made me realize is that I need to be more intentional with my uh, starting my uh, internal or my indoor subterranean greenhouse. There's some things I need to work on and still try to manage the temperature variation because here in Oklahoma it's not so much the cold as it is the extreme heat and humidity and um, so I'm still trying to figure out exactly how best this greenhouse in this environment will be most successful uh, but I think that's going to be the only way that food security is going to happen for for us here uh, for me especially in our family here in Oklahoma because you can't depend on the weather, you can't depend on the temperature, and you sure can't depend on the precipitation. Because we had one of the driest Aprils. Um, you know, April showers bring May flowers, but not this year for us. So um, there's been a lot of shifts and changes here in Oklahoma. The extremes are more extreme, hotter temperatures. Uh, we do have colder colds, but they don't last very long. Uh, and our precipitation comes in downpours, not slow soaking rains. So erosion and not soaking in and runoff and there's all kinds of other issues that relate to that as well so um our plants are our, our trees and our plants bloom early and then it gets so cold so there's some trees that get stunted some plants so it's really hard to really predict anything in oklahoma anymore um so yeah that's kind of my phenology report thank you hi everyone and greetings from raleigh north carolina and I wanted just to tell you all that it has been an absolutely beautiful, beautiful spring. Um, just gorgeous. Um, temperate weather, breezes, some cold at night. Um, but I um, went strawberry picking about a month ago and my brother-in-law commented that, gosh, it seemed awfully early to go strawberry picking. And that prompted me to check the phenology network visualization maps to check and see if it was actually earlier and it did seem a little early to me so lo and behold I checked and it was the earliest spring on record here in the Piedmont of North Carolina and um, we added about um, 13 growing days and in addition to that um, Spring came about 20 days earlier this year. So, here are my little strawberries. Um, and so, in fact, I just wanted to give you that, that even though it seems like it's been a very temperate um, and lovely 
mild spring that in fact because we haven't had those pulses of arctic air come down um it actually was in fact a remarkably early spring so just wanted to give you a little information here from raleigh north carolina good afternoon everybody uvana bob and nupiak senior nuviak Akaga Lois, Apaka Bernard. Sabaktuna Noah National Severe Storms Labmi. Elisiktuna Elisagimi. So I just uh, want to be practicing my Inupiaq, uh, which I've been learning or studying up at Ilislava College in northern Alaska. And uh, I wanted to dedicate this to my mother as well as Mother Earth and my wife's mother's birthday was actually on this day. Um, it's the 10th of May. Panmanbak in New York, Oklahoma me. So I'm speaking to you from Oklahoma today and it's a beautiful day, 68 degrees, and I'm looking forward to sharing some observations around here of the spring and also up in northern Alaska. There was a really strong polar vortex this winter. The vortex finally broke down this spring, occasionally sending cold air down into the U.S., uh, primarily in April and May. Despite very warm sea surface temperatures south of Alaska, there's been um, quite a bit more ice cover this last winter and early spring than uh, has occurred in the last few winters. There was full coverage of ice in the Chuck Sea and Beaufort Seas. These uh, pictures taken from space and, and from the ground show the ice cover off the north coast of Alaska near Barrow uh, in late April. The ice cover with the uh, leads near the coast um, were good conditions for the uh, Arvig or bowhead whale hunt this spring. Temperatures were considerably below normal in February and again in late April. Now back in central Oklahoma, after a, a fairly mild winter, we've had a relatively cool spring with lots of ups and downs. There's been a prolonged period ideal for growth of things like chickweed and wild onion and wild garlic still showing themselves today. The mulberries have bloomed and are producing their first berries right now, and the pecan trees have also bloomed. This barren-looking lawn is in stark contrast with a natural prairie not too far away where uh, there's just a great diversity of different plants growing naturally. Um, they've been blooming pretty much all spring and continue to bloom today um, in very, very many different uh, varieties and colors. I hope uh, this gives you a glimpse of what things look like here, and I hope everybody is doing well and look forward to seeing you on Friday at the session. Greetings, everyone. This is Stephanie Krantz. I work for the Nez Perce Tribe, and I am here in Nimipu country. I am actually in my front yard in Clarkston in eastern Washington really miss everybody and I just wanted to say how sorry I am that we can't be together this year but how grateful I am that we get to go to every session at Rising Voices and I just wanted to take you all through a tour of Nimipu country um, with a slideshow with photos but thought I'd do this intro from my yard where we are actively working on planting a food forest that has native plants and garden plants we have 30 fruit trees and a huge number of native shrubs that we've started to plant, um, including gooseberries and currants and serviceberry and thimbleberry and chokecherry. And we're looking for an elderberry to add to that mix because we're trying to increase our resilience as a family and learn how to eat wild plants and ornamental plants. Like for instance, we have big leaf maples in our yard and we ate maple flowers this year and we have daylilies and we eat daylily flowers. They're delicious and campanulas and other things. 
So the rest of this video is going to be a little slideshow. I hope you enjoy it and I can't wait to see you next year. Katsuya y'all. So the Nez Perce people lived in the Columbia Plateau, which is very close to where the Lummi Nation is and where we would have been meeting. Here's a topo of the Nez Perce Reservation showing the dissected topography and photos from winter of the Grand Ron and of the snow melts, which is quite extraordinary in these parts, as well as, you know, the Lostine River, salmon fishing, the Grand Ron, the Salmon River, and of course the Palouse Prairie, uh, the Nez Perce Prairie. Here's my son enjoying field trips in the wild. Um, this is from the Salmon River Canyon. Here's Pasc, a native plant, and Lomatium, Camas. Um, I don't know the name of this, but it's a lily. Shooting stars. And the mountain showing a huckleberry gathering trip and the fruits of that labor. While living here, I've learned great respect for the Nez Perce people and their knowledge of native plants and how to use them and their resilience in this incredible landscape. And I just wanted to say thank you to them and to all of you for your work to protect Native Americans and their culture. Okay, new the kites. Hello, my friends. This is Katie Jones with my seasonal report from here in Colorado, from the traditional lands of the um, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute peoples. I am uh, I'm Scappy Pecani, Southern Pagan Blackfeet, um, and one of the efforts that I've made recently to decolonize my uh, thinking about my science and um, about the world I live in is to learn the Blackfeet names for the calendar months. This month, the month of May, is Otsixis Otsite Tsipi. And in Blackfeet that means um, when the buffalo flowers bloom. Um, and in uh, Blackfeet tradition, the buffalo flower was the marker of the um, beginning of the migration of the buffalo and so an indicator of the time to prepare for the return of the buffalo. The western name for what is called buffalo plant in Blackfeet territory is uh, Thermopsis rhombifolia and this plant here um, is the, the local relative of that plant. This, the western name for this is Thermopsis divericarpa um, and it I first noticed it blooming um, on May 4th, um, so perhaps similar timing to what we see in what might have been seen historically in uh, Blackfeet territory. Um, but it makes me happy to see it and to think about it as a, uh, a marker of cultural practices of my people, even though I'm not currently on my historic lands. Um, and makes me excited to talk to all of you and think about um, actions that the Indigenous Phenology Network can take together to uh, continue to uh, build relationship with the uh, place and one another. Thanks. Hi everybody, my name is Hannah Ponchi. I work for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission and we're out here in the Shawamigan Nicolay National Forest in Northern Wisconsin on one of our two phenology study sites and just wanted to show you a few things. Uh, the black flies are out, so maybe you can see those. Um, but right here we have a nice patch of wild leeks, um, Baguaji, Jigagawanj, and Ojibwe, and um, some spring beauties mixed in with those. And also some trout lily leaves coming up here. There's some flowers around. Um, and the sugar maple buds are just starting to break through some tiny little leaves coming out. You can just see. Um, oh, there's a trout lily flower up here. This little yellow flower. Um, so we are seeing a lot of spring wildflowers. A lot of green on the ground. Uh, not so much up in the trees yet, but 
we'll have leaves in a couple weeks probably. And uh, just wanted to share that with you guys. Wow. Thanks for those great report outs in the field. You know, the Phenology Network. And I'm so glad to have Hank with me here again, learning all about what the Phenology Network is doing and its contribution to Rising Voices and the Greater Rising Voices Network. Couple of points to cover with everyone, particularly for those, and that's the majority of you that are tuning in on uh, YouTube, watching online in real time. I want to suggest that you can comment either on the YouTube page or using the Facebook uh, VR V8 page. That would give you the ability to jot down any questions, comments, snide remarks for that matter, uh, seasonal jokes, and uh, we have people standing by monitoring all of that. And don't forget, we'll be using our breakout rooms for the first time this time. So we want you to stand by into that also. Uh, we're going to have uh, some information delivered your way by a bunch of people online. It's really good to see you. And it's great to be here again with Hank, with Chris and Hello. Julie and the people in the studio with our hosts, Heather Lazarus and Julie Maldonado. Yay. The help desk, of course, with Mariah Ben-Joseph. Those of you who don't know what you're doing, and by the way, that's about 95% of us in the United States. Those of you who don't know what you're doing, if you need help, call Mariah. Mariah, that's going to be about 275 million people, I think, calling you. I'm not, and I'm real sure about the numbers. But anyway, welcome to Rising Voices VRV8. Thanks for joining us, Miss Heather Lazarus. Able to join us today for the second installment of the virtual Rising Voices 8 meeting. I'm Heather Lazarus. I'm from the National Center for Atmospheric Research here in Boulder, Colorado. And together with Julie Maldonado from the Livelihoods Knowledge Exchange Network, um, and with tremendous support from the Olahana Foundation, Lomi Kai Media, and so many others, um, we'll do our best to navigate this uh, virtual platform for our meeting today. A little of background for anybody who is joining us oh, for the yeah. first time and is new to Rising Voices. The Rising Voices Indigenous and Earth Sciences program facilitates intercultural, relational-based approaches for understanding and adapting to extreme weather and climate events, climate variability, and climate change. Uh, the program brings Indigenous and other scientific professionals, tribal and community leaders, environmental and community experts, students, educators, and artists, and so many more from across the United States, including Alaska, Hawaii, and elsewhere in the Pacific Islands, as well as beyond around the world, brings folks together to assess the critical community needs and to pursue joint research aimed at developing optimal plans for community action towards sustainability. Rising Voices acknowledges the inherent value of indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous sciences, adaptive practices and processes, and honors them equally with earth sciences. Really at its core, Rising Voices aims to advance science through collaborations that bring earth and indigenous sciences together. And by earth science, we include uh, atmospheric, social related social science fields, biologic, ecological, and other disciplines. Bringing everybody into partnership to support adaptive and resilient communities through sharing scientific capacity and also provides opportunities for indigenous students and early career scientists through scientific and community mentoring. Um, in addition, it also the program also helps to uh, bring Western trained scientists to expand their observational skills, their research paradigms, and their capacity to apply and translate findings and ultimately their science. Some of you have joined us also about a month ago for our April kickoff event. This month, we're transitioning to start our thematic series of interactive breakout um, webinars. In these virtual sessions, everybody will have the opportunity to speak, engage, and ask questions in smaller breakout group formats. 
similar to what we would do if we were able to meet in person at our annual workshops. Uh, in partnership with the Indigenous Phenology Network, we're starting off this month with phenology. Um, and phenology considers, as Kalani mentioned already, attention to the timing of natural events in relation to climate and plant and animal life cycles. Uh, next month in June, we will follow with another webinar that will focus on community relocation and site expansion. And then in other months, we will have our other topics that we usually discuss in person when we have that opportunity, including uh, energy systems, water systems, health and well being, and food systems. So for today, a quick note about an additional note about our process. Um, we, will, we will start next when I wrap up with an introduction to the Indigenous Phenology Network and the results of some of the Indigenous Phenology Network's work. Um, the Indigenous Phenology Network really emerged from Rising Voices, so it's a really neat relationship there. Then we will go into breakout groups, at which point uh, everyone has three options. Y'all have three options. Some people are, are joining us and engaging right now through Google Meets. If you are one of those folks, just sit tight, stay in Google Meets and that's where your breakout group will happen. Um, let's see, some folks uh, registered via Zoom, <clears throat> excuse me, registered via Zoom and received a uh, link to join a meeting in their registration. Please go to that link when we're ready for the breakout groups, I will tell everybody when. Um, and there you'll be assigned to a different small breakout group meeting in Zoom where you will have a facilitated conversation we will have note takers taking notes as well. It'll be very helpful if you can state your name before you make any comments so that we can help attribute ideas to the correct people. Um, we will not be recording those sessions. And if you prefer not to have something noted down, please just verbalize that and we will honor that. Um, let's see, if you did not register for a breakout group through Zoom or you prefer not to engage that way, please, we invite you to stay watching YouTube and you will hear more from Kalani and Hank. After the breakout sessions, about an hour long discussion there, uh, we ask that you all please meet back on the YouTube channel where we will have some report out in real time from our breakout group discussions and a wrap up session including next steps and uh, when we'll see you all again next. Uh, so just quickly again, the purpose um, of these thematic groups each month is to reflect on the same themes that we would have had in our in-person meetings, but we do not consider any of these themes in isolation, right? They're all really interconnected and intertwined, so we can bring other uh, systems and processes to bear on our thinking of, for example, this month, phonology. <clears throat> there are three objectives of the working group sessions, the breakout sessions. And these will be reiterated by your uh, group facilitators and they're also in the notes that Julie shared. Firstly, we invite you to share interests, projects, and lessons learned in collaborative phonology related work uh, between indigenous and earth sciences. Second, questions you have about phonology in general or related to an exciting or future project. And third, any collaborations or actions that you can uh, imagine coming out of this gathering. Now I'd like to introduce Brian Miller from the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center and one of the lead organizers of the Indigenous Phonology Network to share more about the IPN. Thanks, Brian. Hey, thanks so much, Heather. Um, thanks for the introduction. Thanks everybody. Um, for being here virtually, and if we can't be together in person, um, yeah, uh, glad that we can we can make it work, especially with the capacity that uh, Olohana and Lomika bring to the table. So thanks to them. Um, so for for those of you out there I don't know, I'm I'm Brian Miller. Uh, I'm an ecologist with the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, and just a, an advance a word in advance here. If my video drops out, I am joined via phone, so um, I'll stick with you that way. But apologies if it does happen. My internet's been a bit spotty. Um, but I'm I'm tuning in here today from Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, on the historical and ancestral lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and, and Ute tribal nations, um, and just up the road from Boulder, Colorado, where um, every other year uh, UCAR and NCAR host uh, this meeting. Um, so a little bit, as Heather mentioned, uh, of background about the Indigenous Phonology Network, or as we call it the IPN. 
Um, well, the IPN is a grassroots organization and it's open to anyone. So those of you out there who are interested in joining us, um, if you do, if, if you haven't already, if you do a quick Google search of the Indigenous Phenology Network, I believe we are the first hit on Google. Um, the USA National Phenology Network has a landing page for us with a bit of background information on us, um, including at the bottom of that page, uh, some information about how to contact me um, or Lohana to be added to the Indigenous Phenology Network listserv and, and join our, our monthly calls. Um, but, but who are we? So um, as I said, we're a grassroots organization. We're really just a, a uh, as I believe I remember um, Bob Goff calling this sort of a coalition of the willing um, uh, of folks who are interested in understanding phenology on lands and species uh, of importance to native peoples. Um, and I would say that really we focus a lot on building relationships um, and on the process of doing so. Um, and ultimately with the goal of ensuring benefit to indigenous communities and um, and doing so through a combination of indig indigenous and Western knowledge systems. Um, and as, as Heather noted, we grew out of Rising Voices, the Rising Voices family. I, I joined Rising Voices in 2015 at Rising Voices 3. And it was apparent there was already a rich and ongoing conversation about phenology through both Western and indigenous lenses. Um, and uh, so I was fortunate to kind of come into that conversation midstream. And during one of the phenology breakouts, there was uh, interest in continuing the conversation in between the Rising Voices meetings sort of throughout the year. And so um, uh, I raised my hand as being willing to kind of try and organize that effort through a monthly call and a listserv. Um, and we got, we got off and going, um, but I, I'd say that we really didn't get our legs under us until um, I and others in IPN came back to Rising Voices the next year uh, in 2016 when we reached back to the Rising Voices community and, and sort of upon reflection realized, you know what, we need um, indigenous leadership, um, uh, you know, as a Western science scientist, um, it, that's okay and all, but we really felt uh, strongly that we needed to have indigenous uh, voices, not only at the table, but in leadership position in IPN. And so that's when Kalani uh, stepped up and, uh, and, and really took the helm and really took us um, to another level. Um, and so over the, over the years since 2016, um, I think we've made some great strides uh, in, in not only building relationships, but doing some real projects and on the ground work. Um, you know, uh, you may be familiar with Dan Wildcat and his students work on the Wakarusa Wetlands Phenology Trail, um, folks at College of Menominee Nation doing uh, amazing work on their phenology learning path. Um, you know, folks like Kalani, Mariah, um, and others um, doing their work on uh, victory gardens virtually interconnected tree gardens. Um, and then of course, I mean, you are now experiencing the um, technological broadcast network capacity uh, of IPN that Lomi Kai, Olohana, and others in the IPN have grown over the past couple of years. And uh, a lot of credit to, to folks in this group who had the foresight to say, hey, you know what, we, we, we should be a network, not only in the social sense, but a network in the broadcast network kind of sense. Um, so that we're prepared to deal with these very kind of situations that we're in right now, um, where we can't be together physically, but we can share information um, and connect with one another virtually. So, um, yeah, I think appropriate that, that uh, um, phonology is the first kickoff here in this Rising Voices uh, series. I'm really I'm proud and excited um, and pleased to be a part of it. Um, so looking forward to having more conversations with you all uh, in the breakout. Um, but for now, I'm going to pass it over to, to Katie Jones. Um, she's another lead in the IPN. Um, she's a plant ecologist, uh, as we heard in, in her uh, video uh, phenology intro there um, with the National Ecological Observatory Network. And uh, she's going to provide a bit more uh, color and detail and information about IPN, um, sort of where we've been recently and, and where we see ourselves uh, going next. So, yeah, thanks a lot, everybody. She's muted on her side. You're muted, Katie. Okay, I was muted apparently. <laughs> um, I'm Katie Jones, as Brian mentioned. I am a plant ecologist with the National Ecological Observatory Network. And within that role, I do focus a lot on uh, phenology and on our standardized uh, phenology measurements across the NAN Observatory. Um, but I'm also a Blackfeet, tribal member, Southern Pagan, um, and in 
and a member of uh, the Indigenous Phenology Network as a way to try and merge those two aspects of both my Western training and education and my Indigenous um, heritage and connections. Um, so I was going to talk briefly about um, a, a recent survey um, of the Indigenous Phenology Network to kind of look at where we've been and think about where we move on from now, from here. Uh, this was covered in the preseason um, pre-recorded video, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, but generally, the IPN is, um, is guided by a set of ideas that are set out in the doctrine of relationship that really prioritizes connections between people and connection and responsibility to our non-human relations. Um, and we're, we can see that um, bearing fruit in our relationship with one another within the IPN. Um, people in their members of the group reported that um, connection and collaboration and respect were um, what they appreciated most about um, being part of the Indigenous Phenology Network and really wanted to use that as a, a really a good starting place to uh, build projects together and to find ways that we can um, actively engage, uh, connect with uh, new collaborators connect across institutions and uh, land management and really develop something tangible together um, and to build it from the ground up. Um, and then also kind of was repeated in the uh, breakout groups in phonology from Rising Voices 7. Uh, some of what we heard in those discussions was that um, frustration with the fact that Western academic research is really struggling to deal with the structural problems um, that come from a colonial born scientific system. It wasn't really built for respectful intercultural co uh, collaborations. So respect, responsibility, reciprocity are all really essential values in native communities, but aren't necessarily taught in the Western institutions. And so there's a, a conflict from the start in that um, space. Um, indigenous communities are often disadvantaged in Western academic research because of this hierarchical structure um, of scientific communities and the power dynamics that are really baked into the whole system, um, into grant proposals, into the privilege of the written word over the spoken word. Um, and so groups discuss these inequalities that lie within words that perpetuate discrimination and noted that any one, that there is no one word in indig any known indigenous language from the people that were present um, that translates into phonology and that can capture the full set of values that that word means um, to indigenous peoples. So a few um, actions that were suggested uh, we want to share and promote indigenous-led science and research and resources, train non-indigenous scientists before they enter communities, change the funding structures and request for proposals to include a focus on process. And to enact this work really requires active pushback against the established system. Um, one avenue for um, using networks like might be to use networks like the indigenous phenology to connect many groups together and help develop the uh, movement. Um, so I hope that sparks some ideas and helps get our uh, conversation going in the breakout groups. And I really look forward to talking to you there. Now back to Heather. Hi again, those were some great pirate jokes that I scanned through briefly on YouTube there. Good job, everybody. Um, now is when we will ask you to please go to the Zoom link that you received either in your registration or through reminder emails from Julie. You may be able to uh, register in, the, in real time if you have not done that already. Otherwise, if you are in um, Google Meets, please stay there. There will be a breakout discussion happening in Google Meets. If you would like to continue watching YouTube and not engage and speak directly, please, we invite you to also do that. 
in about an hour after the facilitated conversations, we ask you to please come back to viewing the YouTube channel and you'll see us all again uh, presenting some breakout, uh, some, some uh, findings from the discussion, some overview of the discussions in the breakout group. So we'll look forward to seeing you back then in about an hour. Thanks so much, see you soon. Hey, fantastic. And uh, those of you who are joining us, welcome. Welcome. We're going to go through sort of an anecdotal and historical perspective of the Rising Voices effort while we're having the breakouts for the IPN network. Now, the IPN breakout networks are specifically designed to protect confidentiality both of the membership, their ability to freely share their thoughts critically, and of information that might be sacred, might belong to a particular family or a tribe or a community's practice. And so to honor that, we're keeping these breakouts anonymous to the public, and available only to those who have been actively involved in the activity or recently authorized by leadership of those various working groups to join the discussion in a constructive way. Meanwhile, we're going to take advantage of the time on our hands to be constructive and literally catch those who are here for the first time visiting our effort for the first time up on the origin, the genesis, the origination, as it were, of this Rising Voices effort with the National Center for Atmospheric Research, sponsored by the University Consortium for Atmospheric Research, and, and of course, uh, partnering with NOAA and several other organizations that uh, help support these efforts throughout the years. Anyway, let's take a look at one of the first introductory videos created year two, year two, Rising Voices at NCAR Boulder, Colorado. Stay tuned for a very special program I'm Duncan Campbell, and we're going to have a special Living Dialogues program with members of Rising Voices, Indigenous Wisdom, and Climate Change. The four questions that the UN asked, this the body of 3,000 scientists around the world, is climate change real? Is there a human fingerprint on it? Are there things we can do to mitigate the causes of climate change? And how do we adapt to those conditions that we can't mitigate. And those answers of the first two are purely scientific. I mean, where do you put the thermometer to get the global warming temperature of the entire globe? It's a lot of science involved, and we trust that the scientists have done that in peer-reviewed ways and have come up with good answers. So is there a human fingerprint on the pollution, on the causes of climate change? Yes, there is. The Greenhouse gas emissions are piling up, causing the planet to, to warm. Um, are there things to mitigate? That gets very political because that involves vested interests of those in the production of greenhouse gas emissions. And a lot of denial took place in that realm. But the last question, physical scientists, climate scientists, were asked about how, does, how, how will we adapt to it? What are the human behavioral strategies? And that's not their area. They've got nothing in that, in that realm. But they came back to the UN and they said, you need to go home and talk to your local people and talk to your indigenous peoples to see how we can begin to adapt to a changing, very rapidly changing world. And when you look at the definition of science in general, our ancestors have been practicing science for thousands of years. The descendants that exist today wouldn't be here today if we weren't able to transfer that knowledge, duplicate, uh, hypothesize, experiment. Some of these communities who have been living there for thousands of years before anyone else ever came 
um, they were there and learning how to live in this environment. And as it's changed over those centuries, they've continued to adapt to it. And so how have they done so? Why not turn to them for some of those answers? They understand that part of the problems we've created in the world is this sort of misguided notion that there's one best way of doing things, that there's one answer to all problems. People don't want the best practices, they want the best practice. The miseducative dichotomy of the Western tradition where we think that there's some tension, some conflict between nature and culture is something that is completely foreign to indigenous thinking, to native thinkers. We understand that our cultures were emergent out of these symbiotic relationships. If we could reconnect the biological, the ecological diversity of the planet with the cultural diversity that we need so that we can live well in those places, I think we could address many of the most pressing problems we face on the planet today. What we're trying to do is to create a new vocabulary that brings Western science and indigenous knowledge together on the same playing field, same credibility, same legitimacy, and now develop together a language that allows us to communicate this shared knowledge. And we move in different paths and different streams, but guess what? Those streams merge, they converge, and when they do, something new can emerge out of that. So, that's kind of an early look at the genesis, the impetus, as it were, the incentive for creating rising voices. <clears throat> you know, uh, Bob Goff, Robert Goff had a big hand in creating rising voices, and that's somebody who uh, had just befriended yeah, uh, Hank Ferguson the year before his transition. And uh, really a shame, I was looking forward to the big work the two of you were going to do together around land rights and indigenous rights here. But, you know, they say it's easier to pull a rope than to push it. So uh, I'm glad Bob is on the other side with Pat and the boys, and hopefully they're pulling a rope and uh, going to make things a lot easier for the rest of us as we're moving along. But Uncle Hank... Uh, you know, we were so glad you joined us for this specific reason to uh, evaluate the entire effort at the end of the thing. What are you thinking so far? You've been with us for about a month and a half, coming to various meetings. Yeah, actually, I, I'm, I'm actually quite intrigued at, at what is going on here. And I'm, um, I'm certainly glad we're starting to look back and embracing the past. Um, it is from our past that we're going to be able to see it forward, yeah. And um, I, I really like these evaluations of the climate um, on different coasts, stuff like that, because this is, the, you know, you guys start off before us, right? We're in the back end of it. So whatever you're seeing, it's coming this direction. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying this very much. Um, how can I say? I can see it forming like a head. So we'll see how that works out. I love that. I, and, and I want to note, you know, particularly for Katie, you remember how Weather Service is reading the pattern coming across the Pacific Ocean, I, right? Impacting the West Coast and then moving across the continent following the jet stream. But did you hear Uncle Hank? Did you hear how the indigenous people are looking at it? They're saying, no, no, no. What you see on the East Coast, you later see centrally. Coming this way. Then you later see on the West Coast. Then you later see coming this way. Right? A complete 180 degree perspective from weather service, <laughs> from the way the technology and the satellites are reading it. So, again, this is part of my interest in us investigating this intersection, right? There's something about us reading it coming from both directions. Right. I mean, what do you, what's your take on that, Katie? <laughs> She's like, what? <laughs> yeah, you, you <laughs> with your good. muted microphone, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Zoom difficulties. She's like, wait, 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 technical difficulties. I, I, I was here for information about what's going on. I'm sorry. No, I, I understand, but I was thinking you could uniquely share, given Uncle Hank's perspective on we actually read the because it's true i learned to read the weather backwards too coming from the east right. coast right. towards us which is like i said 180 degrees from where national service teaches us to read the weather with our instruments well how do you think that's going to be applicable as we merge science i mean we're literally merging technologies but we're merging frameworks and clearly perspectives, right? That are yes. completely different. How do you think that's gonna be incorporated in the science world as we move forward? And I know you advocated for it to be incorporated, but how do you think it's really gonna work out? And Paulette, I'll come to you afterwards. That is a great and difficult question. Um, I think one thing that we've seen is that uh, often Western science has a, a really strong opinion of what is right, what is true. And it's not until Western science finds details that um, uh, corroborate a, an indigenous story that they um, change their model and say, oh, there was the information all along that we never paid attention to. Um, so this could definitely be one of those stories, but how, how do we start, you know, knocking on those doors and saying um actually pay attention now and start using this information in developing uh, you know our world view instead of waiting for western science to disprove itself to believe an indigenous story and i have to go now <laughs> oh brilliant brilliant no thank you katie yeah, i knew you, you had to go that's why i wanted to get to you now and brilliant yeah. that is precisely the point and i think hank and I'm gonna to come to Paulette on this because I think it's right up where her arguments lay, right? Um, I think that this idea of parity of equity between the two knowledge systems is in fact gonna be the big policy moment, right? Because it's sitting in policy, budget is following policy. Right, and budget is giving capacity to whatever group policy is reinforcing. So this idea that policy and leadership, political legislation, practical application of administration of goods and resources needs to be seriously reevaluated and reappropriated to places that matter in this short time scale seems to be something that needs to be paramount and forward in our conversations. Pauline? Sorry, I was, uh, I've got a little bit of a technical thing going on on one side. So I've been jumping around and, and I, um, I got parts of the question. So my apologies, I was playing um, facilitator. Uh, not speaker today, and I was not 100% uh, clued in. Um, what Katie mentioned about these differences between indigenous sciences and Western sciences uh, is, is totally on point. And I wanna kind of feed into that by saying, you know, the science that is considered the standard by which all others are judged currently is a Eurocentric based settler colonial science. And we need to remember that that science is one of the pillars of not only colonization, but assimilation and recognize that it's one perspective that has been co-opting other people's knowledges and repackaging it and appropriating it and reselling it for generations. And to be cognizant of the fact that the current science system that, you know, not only the, the methodologies, but the methods um, are based in a worldview that, um, doesn't allow, they, they exclude the outliers because they're so busy trying to find the pattern where indigenous knowledge is quite the opposite. We understand and live with the pattern and look to the outliers as um, um, evolution, revolution, uh, diversity. You know, these are where things happen in 
the environment or in um, a species where an adaptation, you know, that, you know, where science will call it a, mis you know, a mistake or, you know, it's an anomaly, that anomaly could be the difference between life and death for a species. And indigenous people have been very respectful and cognizant of these things, you know, that nature doesn't necessarily make mistakes per se, but they, uh, but, but it creates opportunities for diversity. And the diversity is where survival happens, being able to, you know, survive, you um, a blight or a, an illness or disease or what have you. So these these things are um, just some simple perspectives of the differences between indigenous philosophies of science and knowledge production and, and uh, Western Eurocentric sciences. So it's not to say that one is better or worse than the other, but they're both they're both subjective to a certain extent. The difference for me personally is that indigenous science respects and allows space for other ways of seeing, knowing, and doing, uh, where Eurocentric science dispels it if it's not based in its its own foundational theories and, and um, history. You know, uh, anybody that spends a little time with the history of science will find out that, you know, science has been co-opting other you know, this Eurocentric science we depend on has been co-opting knowledges from Mesopotamia, Egyptians, and all these other others uh, groups for, for hundreds and thousands of years. Indigenous knowledge systems have been sharing these knowledges. I mean, from the Inca food systems with the terraces of, of testing all the different places and conditions a, a corn or a potato or whatever plant might grow in, you know, by altering its elevation, its temperature, its precipitation, its light, uh, it, you know, just to, to diversify the food potential. Uh, was instrumental in the success of, of, of not only South Americans, uh, but that knowledge was shared. So um, it's not a commodified knowledge, it's a res relational knowledge. And I think that's, an, that's another important and exciting thing to, um, to bring into the current system of science now is this idea of not only reciprocity, but um, exchange in a, in a fair and respectful and uh, transparent manner. So, um, yeah, Kalani, any more questions? Dude, that was perfect. That was spot on. What can I say? I, and I'm so glad you had the time to jump in. I know you guys are monitoring other stuff, but here at the onset, before I lost you to questions and answers and other facilitations in small groups, I was interested in making sure that the women were also having a voice in this little conversation before two old guys uh, start talking about what they know about rising voices. But in that regard, Uncle Hank, I wanted to give you a chance to respond to what you heard these two lovely young ladies, uh, Paulette and Katie, both of them pillars of the Rising Voices yes. effort in the last few years. And what do you think about what you heard about their approach, uh, the way they regard their work, and coming to their work and their idea of community and connectedness. Well, you know, it's it's um, it's actually very refreshing. Um, the the chant that we shared this morning was the foundation of the gods, and it was only to describe that in the back of all of us we have some foundational knowledge that is is what science doesn't quite have, and and what science is slowly but surely learning is that. Ours doesn't change. The, the present changes to where they can see ours. Like, for instance, the chant we were talking about this morning had to do with the pathway of the rain, had to do with the ocean where we, we come from, and then the sun that, that heats up the ocean and brings it into the heavens, and then the, the calling of the water down from the, down from the heavens into the mountains that it may feed everything on the way to the ocean, yeah? So it's the pathway of the water. And all of our cultures have that in us, in our, in our past, and it's, it's so important to understand these are fundamental things. If you understand the pathway of the water, you can understand pretty much everything, you know? And, and that's what really what we're protecting, right? Is that pathway of the water. Um, go ahead, I'm sorry. 
No, it's true. And you, as you can see, this next generation of scientists, uh, e.g., Katie and Paulette, seem to be attuned a little differently than those old science professors we had way back in the Thank 60s God. and early <laughs> 70s, you know, in Berkeley and uh, and campuses beyond. So, yeah, I'm right. Life is changing. We're understanding science differently. And institutions such as NCAR are really trying to get a new handle, a new understanding on science and how it's impacting. And if you don't think it's important, then look at the both myopic and disturbing distance the American public has from the reality of science. Oh, yeah. You know, so we definitely have to find new ways to tell the story, new ways to communicate our science learning. And I think that's what Rising Voices is about, as you'll learn in this uh, second clip we're rolling along. As the years go by, we're trying to record our efforts. Rising Voices is different because there is a sharing of knowledge across a wide range of indigenous communities. It's an opportunity for people from many different backgrounds to come together to have a conversation about how they might build partnerships. And we're learning about what, what's happening from the people that it's happening to. We're not just reading about it or watching it on TV. And um, it makes you want to do more, to be more engaged. What have been best practices with other cultures? Many, many communities know their culture, you know, but they don't necessarily know all the practices that have worked in other climates and other environments. So sharing of that sort is what Rising Voices has allowed. And there's a positivity about the conversation and an encouraging manner that you feel inspired. Bringing not only this holistic approach, but bringing a new level of understanding and I think that's one of the things I really like about this Rising Voices. We are talking to each other and we're starting to actually understand both, both sides, but also both sides are learning as a result. All adaptation is local. And having it done on the micro scale, in backyards and in communities, that is where the greatest resilience is going to come for the entire community and I think for the nation. Uh, by this, I don't mean any one of the Indian nations, but for the United States. Yeah, you can see where we were on all of this, Hank, um, and where Bob was instrumental in creating right. this line of thinking about community. What do, what do you think about this approach? Is this something that could be beneficial in Hawaii? I think it's extremely beneficial. I mean, when sharing of information is so important, especially... You know, it's really nice to see indigenous people from the other side, like you said, the 180 degrees from us. And um, what's what's really good is to understand that it's really not that much difference. There's just a 180 degree turn. That's all. It's the same thing we're looking at. Which makes sense, right? If you're standing on the western side of the bowl and you're looking at the eastern edge, it makes sense that the guy standing on the eastern side of the bowl looking at the western edge is having an 180 degree experience from yours. Right. You're both standing in the same bowl, which brings us to the desired impact of efforts like this, rising voices, is to recognize that everybody's within the closed loop system. Hey. Everybody's living within the atmosphere on this planet. You know, very interesting conversations we're all being invited to, where we ask, ooh, what a portion of this, what part is the indigenous part? What part is the native part, the indigenous rights part, the people of the earth part? I'm wondering, which one of you guys is not from earth? What exactly is going on here? It's all 
part of the indigenous thing. The entire thing is just one deal. And we were here for a long time, a couple thousand years before you guys started keeping books. So that being said, Uncle Hank, as somebody who's a spokesperson for the elders in community, and after hearing what is advocated by not just the science community and the young women scientists that you heard earlier in the program and the videos that you just saw, which talk about the philosophy, the thinking engaged in the science community, are you seeing that translate into the public processes? I certainly see a potential here. I mean, the, the potential is enormous. And uh, like I said, it, it's really refreshing to see young scientists, especially women, that are out there in the front. It's really, really important. Um, we all know the, the world's been overly dominated by men, and we screwed it up a lot. So it's very important really? to have, no, no, no. have our women. No, no, tell me how you really feel. Okay, <laughs> no, no, no. No. no, so sorry, get back on track there. So we need women in the effort, apparently. Yes, indeed. Well, you know, there's an old Polynesian saying if you want to talk about something, get all the men together. <laughs> That's it. You know, there's, there's no other part to the saying. It's. If you want to yeah. do something, you got you got to get another group together. It ain't gonna be the men. They are gonna sit around and talk about this all day long, you know. So Paulette, yes, enlighten us onto the bad behavior of most of us swinging <laughs> Charlies. I wasn't going there. I swear I wasn't going there. I just wanted to ask you to you know um, just let the the group know that is staying with us on the YouTube page that. We've been having some technical difficulties with the Zoom rooms and to be patient, it may or may not work. We don't know, but we're trying hard to figure it out. And in the meantime, thank you. This has been a great discussion and you know, please bear with us that this, you know, we're gonna try to do our best. Right good. Yeah, let's, let's Mariah, jump on in here, baby. And by the way, I loved when we were talking about Colombianas and the Incans, you know what I mean? Because you guys got a lot going on, especially when it comes to the sweet potatoes. And so oh, enlighten yeah. us. Aloha, everybody. I just wanted to acknowledge that we're having some difficulties with the Zoom room, but um, Julie Maldonado just sent out another email with all of that information, so you should be able to access that. If you can refresh your email browser, you should be able to see um, the new link that was sent out. And also, if you would like to have a conversation in the Google Meets room, you can also head over there. There are definitely people having a discussion over there. And um, otherwise, you can stay here on this YouTube, which is very awesome. Or you can, if you would like to engage more on a conversational level, you can access that through um, the new link that Julie just sent out to everybody's email. Wow, wow. This is like the sophomore Olympics. It's not quite the junior Olympics, and it sure ain't the Olympics, but it's like <laughs> television coverage like no other from somebody's living room. Thanks, you guys. I love the bouncing back and forth, and I'm yeah. glad that in real time, we can get our help desk to communicate. We can adjust and move. All of this is a fabulous experiment in social protocol Hi. in this new video conferencing age and how's that boo i know you were an early computer programmer back with mag cards yeah and punching those little re the world has changed i mean look at this you're broadcasting how do the indigenous elders view change technology overall well quite frankly they're just catching up in, in actuality, I mean, and that's actually one of the biggest problems we have in our communications is that our younger people are, are tech savvy and our older people are not. So trying to be able to bridge that gap so we can get our kupuna online um, and, and also allow our younger people to view the kupuna that are foundational, yeah? By kupuna, you mean the elders. Yes, oh, the the elders, elders. Yes. Sorry about that. We're translating to a lot of different cultures and yes. frameworks. So 
we want to make sure that we're getting that point across. So elders, you're thinking, need more access via the internet yes. or these digital what platforms. We, what we really need is for our young people to take the time to come and teach us, older people, how to utilize these tools. Oh, wait a minute. Hold it. Time out. Right, did he just say we need the young people to come and teach these Aye. elders? Ah, ah, ah. That's one of the things we've been talking about at Rising Voices since the onset, right? And that is that children learn from their parents and the parents learn from their elders. But the elders, they definitely learn from the children. Aye. Right, so there is an interconnectedness, a relational value that in modern society, when we stretch it out, that there's the children, the parents, the grandparents who have been reduced to being senile people that are away on cruises or living in a senior citizen's fun home. And then there's the government that somehow is the great authority that represents this big spiritual authority, some invisible person in the sky that we're all adhering to. Not quite the way indigenous people saw life or the cycle of life. And so those frameworks are impacting our educational institutions, the way we see and learn science even today. Now I can tell you that the science we learned in the 60s, the geoscience, the biological science, and the botanical science. Wouldn't you say that it's pretty much changed and most of what we learned is proven to be null and void? Well, I don't know if you could say it would be null and void. I, I, again, I think it's, you know, we're trying to build this bridge between the older and the younger, yeah? Um, where information can transfer back and forth without, um, how do you say that? Having this is a society where you're the old guys and you're the young guys, it's, we're, we're just all the same guys, okay? <laughs> we just need to help each other along and um, quit trying to one-up each other. You know, the, if, if you really have something one up, then teach it. That's what you're supposed to be doing, not just saying I got one up, right? Show the difference. Yeah. One-upmanship as something that we know about in tribal circle. Paulette, you want to talk about that competition in the yeah. native world? I guess I've been on subject. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it's like it. Oh, Paulette, look. Oh, competition. Um, competition <laughs> is rude. You're not supposed to be competitive, individualistic. You're supposed to be communal and reciprocal and related and relational, you know? You know, yeah, sure, there's a little bit of competition. You should see us at our traditional football games every spring. Those women against the men are rugged. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we have rules, you know? The women can throw the football with their hands and the men can only kick it. But yeah. you know, there's certain relatives you can't, you know, you can't be aggressive with or touch and grandmas, you know, you, you know, just hands off and they just run the football in. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's supposed to be for the good of us all, not for me, my, and I mentality, but for yes. we, us, and ours. Yes. And when you use that um, objective for collaborative and communal uh, reciprocity and relatedness and respect and responsibility, you know, be accountable with our responsibilities. That's where we start getting into these, these uh, colonial settler colonial systems that screw up our traditional systems of governance, our traditional systems of, of being in, in general. And that is a problem that it, you know it runs rampant and a lot of younger people i've i've been learning and meeting and becoming um just in, inspired by a lot of younger native generation is really taking charge to bring back some of these traditional ways because you know we've got several generations of of 
um, elders and uh, grandmas and aunties and stuff that were abused and went through yes. boarding oh, school yeah. and went through the violence of, of, of that whole process of forced assimilation and, and boarding school and, and stuff. And so, you know, we've only had about, I don't know, 40, 50 years, maybe max, where there's not been like this ginormous major trauma. Right. And yeah, the trauma is still there. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But we've had a little bit of time to heal, heal ourselves heal our young people and try to be um, like my grandma used to say, you know, you, you've got to just learn how to run faster in the white man's tennis shoes. And um, it's like, you know, so it's, it's important for us to recognize that, yeah, we're still going to have to run, but we're not competing against each other. Right. We're running to catch up and pass, you know, the system because the system is broken. That's and if yeah. we're going to fix it, We've got to be in this system to a certain extent. And I've learned this from you, Kalani, because I've fought this so hard about making change from the inside. And, um, but there's so many spaces on the inside I've learned that we need to be to, to try to affect change. Hey, yo. And, and it's hard. And it's, and, but, it, but if we don't have each other in that process, it will eat us up and spit us out because it, hey, if yo. you drink Kool-Aid and become like them, then you are like them and you are just lose your spirit and your, your soul kind of. And, you know, when you, um, when you concede to this system, when you become, when you become the system. So, I mean, it's important to, yeah, become, to get into those spaces, but not to be the system. And, um, and that's hard. So that's why the mentors and the groups that like this are so important because we are allowed to, to be who we are and talk about the work that, is relevant and important and find ways to collaborate to fund these issues and to um, implement the changes and the policies and the programs that need to happen. You know, I mean, diversity doesn't happen by just a drop of brown and stir. You have to really create space for multiple diverse peoples, you know, not just Okay, I have an, 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 an I have an Indian. Well, no, no, natives are just as diverse as Europeans or Africans from each of those countries. They've got different languages, different cultures, different place-based identities, and 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 such. So we have to um, teach the settler society that just because for them white is white, indigenous communities and other communities around the world um, appreciate their diversity. Sameness is not healthy. Same, sameness is, is uh, uh, a dead end street genetically. So the diversity is, is, is more than just um, lip service. It's actual intentional. intentional. Um, and nature teaches us that. I mean, how beautiful to see the diversities of birds and trees that have similarities and are clearly are related, but yet are different. And I think that's that's something that phenology has been a blessing in sharing is, is how do these places that are diverse have similarities? Um, and how can some of these different solutions potentially transcend space and place and be implemented for another place's solution uh, or problem, solution to their problem? So, I mean, these are these are a lot of really good lessons. Yeah, and I want to accent what Paulette was saying by reminding us all that it's the UN, you know, Culture and Diversity Day, the 23rd of May, and this whole weekend celebrating culture and diversity. And when we say that, we're not talking about the pretty beads you can buy down at the, you know, the little exhibition hall when you come to the native, you know, American governance group or, you know, any of the countless efforts that are engaged in that supposedly have, as I think Paulette was hinting, that one brown person that they can point at and go, see, diversity. In fact, it doesn't happen like that. Diversity is what European explorers called nature. When they showed up and they looked and they didn't see things in rows, neatly cleaned up or the grass organized or a road leading to a drawbridge or a castle, that was just nature. It was wilderness. 
it's not wildness, it's diversity. And I couldn't agree more. I keep wondering why they treat us as separate, small, individual tribes. That's so they can continue to refer to us as minorities. When actually globally, we way outnumber the Western Europeans, but they keep talking about themselves as if they're the majority. It's not the majority, it's that they're the dominant narrative. Now that's... Not much longer either. No, that's a bitter pill to swallow, yeah. particularly as I think Hank is hinting, not much longer. I mean, back to our two shot there, my friend, and you see, Hank, you're having frontline experience with the United States military, with the state government, with county government, nice. and with private interests representing the elders council here on the island of Mokulkeabe. What is your take on this? How is governance reacting to elders? Well, you know, I, I, I really appreciate, Paulette, what you were saying because you brought you brought into light some of the things that I worked on for years. And that's it's it's um how the United States views its indigenous peoples and how no matter how they viewed us, we keep popping out of the out of nowhere. And we're popping out stronger and stronger and stronger. We're not even we're not even trying to be seen anymore. Our light is just being seen whether we're trying to or not. And what's what's happening with us is we're becoming so much more comfortable with each other that um, it, it's kind of like people are different, yes, but the more difference we have, the better our, our garden will grow, right? Um, we're moving away from that Western idea of monocropping even in our minds, right? Um, and as you were saying, you know, it, it takes a village. It really does take a village, and why? Because you need all those types of inputs. 360 degrees to a circle. It can't be only your view, right? So it's like, this is really important that we understand that and that we we welcome the difference. It's like, wow, I've never heard of that one before. That's really good. And we, I've always kind of leaned on this idea that you don't want to run to a conclusion because that's kind of like an end point. You've concluded. It's like, no, 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 leave that door open, gang. There's tomorrow, okay? It's going to come. But anyway, thank you very much, Paulette. There's tomorrow. It's going to come. You know, um, well, I'll go along with the first part of that statement anyway, enthusiastically. Um, the sun is, in fact, going to rise, and we're hoping that we get to do it better. And we get to do it better if we continue to build the relationships that we're focused on. Not just rising voices, but in IPN. So we want to encourage everybody to join the IPN listserv by the end of this program and get involved in watching the seasonal changes that occurred in your area. You know, I also, also recorded spring coming about 16 days earlier this year in my own observation. So... Is it the tilt of the planet? Is there something going on gravitationally? I know that our stars are slightly out of alignment. And mm -hmm. I believe my Ninuvet, you know, and Clinkett and Alouet friends would say the same thing. That when they're doing the navigations, things are slightly askewed. So, you know, uh, indigenous looks, indigenous perspectives, necessary necessary so as my grandfather would say the past should always inform us it should just never control us so the no past vote. should always yes. have a voice never have a vote because the factors are changing I... the conditions under which we live change continuously so we as new leadership old new leadership right have to both be faithful to the leadership that came before us and understand faithfully the leadership that is coming after us and that has been 
the mission of Rising Voices these past eight years. And I want Paulette to comment on that because we met some 10, 11 years ago at Haskell University. And I remember the first time we were at Rising Voices and she was invited there as a student, a participant with Daniel Wildcat. And that was not good enough for me. So uh, you want to bring them up to speed on what the spirit was like that first town hall? Oh my goodness, the very first meeting was so awkward. Um, it wasn't bad. It was just, they had all of, they had, it was, there was only 18 of us, I think, max. And there was a table and all of the natives sat at the table together. And then the non-native people sat along the wall and it felt like we were like under a spotlight <laughs> or in a fishbowl and, and all of us natives are like, this is, this is not going to work. And so we're like, no, 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 you guys got to join the table. You know, we're not, you know, we're not here to be kind of observed. We're here to engage. And, and they came to the table and, and that was, that was the first one that, you know, the first RV and there was good discussions and lots of laughter and teasing and trying to, you know, make each other comfortable because this was a lot of our first time, you know, sitting in a at the table instead of on the menu, as Bob would say, um, in a discussion about climate and the the needs of indigenous peoples and students and such in the conversation. And then I think it was 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 it the second one that we were at an um, it, it was in Boulder again, and and Kalani was like, okay, we have this meeting, we have this this. Um, panel set up and it was all men and Kalani's like nope nope stop everybody everything stop we need a woman up here and I'm still a student at Haskell just sitting up there or just out of Haskell and I was all quiet he's like Paulette come up here and be the feminine voice and I was like oh what <laughs> looking around me and um I, I don't know what he saw in me, but I, my voice has never been quiet since not that it was before I think <laughs> But that that changed that changed the narrative. That was the beginning of a very inclusive and very um, the beginning of the gender balance in RV and um, the leadership as well as you know not just it wasn't just the male voice leading and telling and guiding. It was this collaborative voice and. Um, I hate to kind of, you know, point it out now, but it seems like the women are leading this now. Yeah. And, and it's not just at Rising Voices. Indigenous women are leading worldwide. And it just takes a second to look at things like, you know, Standing Rock, what happened there? It was the youth and the women. I don't know more, youth and women. And, and the Two-Spirit community, let me not forget those, that, you know, that group. Um, and, and the, it's common, you know, Mauna Kea, you know, there's a lot of aunties and, and grandmas and sisters and daughters that are up there with the rest of the, you know, with the men, but the women, you know, the women are the last line of defense in a lot of communities, indigenous communities. And when the women stand up, you know, it's, you know, it's powerful. So, so yeah, Kalani, thank you for being an advocate for the balance, for the diversity and for the, um, the growth, not just my growth, but there's a lot of other native students that have been native peoples now, you know, native scholars, native community members that have been inspired and given an opportunity through RV to, to not only have a voice, but to exercise that and implement ideas and be part of something that they know is bigger than all of us. So Nyawe. No, man, thank you, my sister. Thank you yes, for thank being you. there to answer the call. That's the whole point, all of us. You know, I was a snot-nosed little kid when the elders came knocking on my door, and my reaction was, what? No, I'm going to go play uh, Jimi Hendrix music and go to New York City and uh, fuck you. You know, and uh, it's what we all do, right? This is the journey of life, the connectivity of the wisdom of the elders to the enthusiasm, the ideology of the youth to the plodding, laborious day-to-day -day support of the parents, you know what I mean, to the aging wisdom of the elders 
And this cycle just continues. And this framework of interrelated cycling, it's a framework understood by indigenous and native cultures, playing out in our leadership, playing out in our relationships, and not played out in the dominant culture. They have a hierarchical stack that goes on to some imaginary information source that if it's not a white man in the clouds pointing at another man, then it's, uh, it's some extraterrestrial beyond the galaxy that has come here to deliver, you know. It's always something way out there. Whereas the native peoples, those with the more elder perspective, see it as a closed circle, as a closed loop system, as one that feeds itself. Now, I'm suggesting that the science, the science suggests that maybe the native perspective of the closed loop system might be closer to reality. And it is in that regard that we were anxious and very, very excited about being invited to the Rising Voices effort. I remember that first year, you said, what, 18 of us? Not even 20 of us in that room. Second year, far more of us. And Mariah, I'm going to come to you because you started coming to the third year and beyond. And what's Rising Voices now for somebody who came to it much later? What's the experience like now when you come? You're muted. <laughs> Does she know that? Though? It is really an awesome experience. I have... I feel like I've been welcomed into such an amazing community and um, just seeing how the interaction now is happening between cultures and between the Western culture and indigenous cultures and the conversations that are happening in the room and sometimes the uncomfortable situations that are happening and then being um, talked about afterwards and really debriefed in a way that um, I haven't done unless I'm like, you know, in a relationship with somebody that I really want to make things work with. And so I think that that's something that's um, just so people are really starting to humanize everybody rather than putting them into this group that's untouchable. And while I have no connection to somebody like that, or I'm not able to have a conversation because I don't even know their name. I think there's really this um, coming together and, you know, this awkwardness, but that's almost such a good human experience. And, you know, it gives scientists and Native Americans and Hawaiians and um, so many different cultural people the ability to bridge gaps that um, were really wide before and are hopefully become and in, in this group are, are definitely um, the gaps are becoming much smaller and much more able people are able to jump over them. Agreed. That's, Agreed. That's, Chris, yes. why don't you roll that last tape for our viewers who are just coming to Rising Voices for the first time so they can see some of the work we've been doing over the years, especially around the bridging. major component is, uh, you know, as a young person, I think, is I've when I listen into these conversations, I've, I'm, I have incredible admiration and respect for, for elders, experts, and leaders in the area. They know what they're talking about. They have... A, an incredible depth and breadth of knowledge that I can't even begin to comprehend. In ancient Hawaii, we had this notion that we are all ohana, we are all related, we're in this together and we are connected. Only by caring about each other can we survive. Because I see a collaboration of different mindsets that normally would not have a conversation outside of the rooms, com commenting about this urgent problem, going back and forth, collaboration, it's an amazing thing that normally would not have happened under any other circumstance. And why I choose to participate is this is an opportunity that not very many youth will get to choose, will get to participate in. Hello, um, I'm Sage Nishida, and I'm working on the INCLUDES project. Um, Where are we? Where are we? Love Where friends. are we? 
Love Farm, right? We're at the Love Farm in... In Ponaka'a. We've just been measuring out the area where we're going to put the gardens, the big, like, food forest. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're gonna put them, we're gonna put three right now, but maybe four. We haven't decided because there might be buildings. But we've just measured out the layout so we know how big the gardens are gonna be. And we just finished installing the soil moisture probes. There's four different depths, so we can get the different readings at different depths of how much moisture is in the soil. Um, we have 90, um, we have 60, 30, and 10 centimeters. Um, and then we're gonna come check these regularly and see what the moisture in the soil is like. And that's what I love about Rising Voices, right? Is real work, real community on the ground. For those of you who uh, noticed that uh, circle, in the last shot as it's rising, that's within a uh, agroforest, food forest, and learning garden. That particular circle is a moon calendar that also has the annual seasonal climate pieces built into it so we're using the information as you saw from modern science with soil probes with satellite link ups with our monitoring coupled with indigenous knowledge about seasonality about phonology about right differences yeah. so we're using this to also teach social values and skills and different uh, religious and cultural expressions and uh, you know how do you think that kind of learning is going in the community Hank I mean you yourself are a practitioner of one of the older religions um I you know it, it's it's so amazing because this ain't this older knowledge is so necessary for right now um it, it, it's almost funny because it's almost like science and I and don't I'm not trying to make a slur here of anything but it's just amazing how white people have a way of of uh, announcing the obvious it's like, <laughs> it's like well I'm, I'm glad you finally arrived to it but I mean you know it's like I mean it, it seems just absolutely amazing to me how well they can repeat the obvious <laughs> that's funny because you know some people might call that science that when they science. keep repeating repeating the exercise and then they go well 87 times out of 100 times <laughs> this happened so it must be true you know in fact what natives know to be true is no two snowflakes are the same exactly no two grains of sand no two leaves no so is since that is what seems to be the blueprint of the universe why or oh why are we thinking that it doesn't happen i mean paulette tell them all about your no two puppies the same <laughs> how cute huh? yeah 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 puppies um my my pit bull blue pit bull bred with a great pyrenees Great Pyrenees are white, not a wow. single white puppy yeah, in a group. My dog's got it down. You know, yeah. you know I, I got black and striped and brown puppies, not a single white puppy. So, I mean, there you go. Incredible. <laughs> Look at that. So mm -hmm. cute. Look at the markings on that one, too. Right on the nose, right under the chin. Yeah. Perfect. Look at that. Perfect. It looks brindle even. So beautiful. You see? No two puppies the same. No two puppies the same. This, in fact, is the rule of nature. No two things the same. Right? Viva so why difference. are we getting upset? Viva la difference. Viva la difference. And this is what phonology and the awareness of phonology brings to our learning community. That everything changes. There is nothing static. 
So the reductionist model of science that keeps pulling us into Leonardo's mechanistic universe limits, limits our ability to understand the phenomena we're actually observing. What we need to do instead is perhaps take some of the expressive freedoms of Dennis McKenna, you know what I mean, and the other fine folk that are living on the edge of shamanism and the social behavioral points, and apply, apply the spiritual aspects to the scientific learning. Now, if you're wondering whose historical footsteps to follow in, how about Isaac Newton? You know, for all the scientists. How about Isaac Newton, who also was extremely spiritual and followed that path? How about Albert Einstein, who said that God does not play dice with the universe, right? So get it together. Try to figure out what the patterns are. Remember, remember Albert Einstein's famous quote, you know, the intuitive mind is the gift and the logical, rational mind is the faithful servant. We have created a society where the gift is being ignored and right. the faithful servant is being called the master of the house. Right. So careful how we view science and indigenous knowledge and the careful examination of that is in fact rising voices. So thank you for joining us here on VRV8. And let's go back to Heather and Julie Maldonado and find out what's been going on in our breakout rooms. Now, I want to warn you that our breakout rooms are going to be involved in a lot of different discussion points. And these discussion points are going to be reported out one group at a time. So those of you who are just joining us for the first time, Rising Voices, or new to the community this year, you should be aware that we will be reporting out only, only the information that is agreed to by the participants within the room. One of the original agreements, paramount agreements, of rising voices is to protect the intellectual property rights, the spiritual rights, the publishing rights, and the literary rights of the information gleaned by these communities. So to continue honoring our community elders, to continue accessing in unprecedented ways the information, both through elders, storytellers, cultural practitioners, native scientists, new native students, and the young people from the native communities, both in education and in the community itself, networking for community capacity. I say again, in Rising Voices, we access these communities in un unprecedented ways. This is what makes it not only a worthwhile venture, but one that is supported by a holy host of sponsorships. Everyone from Honor the Earth to the Hawaii Community Foundation, including and not limited to the University Corporation for Advanced Research. So we are we are definite atmospheric research, right? My apologies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Thank you, Paulette. I love the fact that Chris is a lip reader and just through osmosis I've 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 uh, I've learned to read those lips too. So uh, uh, and uh, I guess there's a whole nother story about two lips, but we won't go there. And uh, and by that, to get your mind out of the gutter, I was talking about tulips from Holland and the uh, economic development of Europe. So uh, just letting you know that we know how you indigenous people think. So, <clears throat> which mostly is having fun. 
And if we can't have fun during this period of the COVID pandemic, bad leadership and governance, irresponsibility when it comes to communal health, and irresponsibility, I might add, from the science community, when it comes to information, when it comes to communication, when it comes to adaptation for our communities to what apparently is the new reality. I don't want new reality to be the cloak worn by the new fascists. So let's make sure that as we move ahead as the scientific community, we do so bravely. We do so assured in the knowledge base that we're asserting, assured in the facts that we present, and knowing that we have critically inspected these assumptions before we begin to responsibly assert them to the public. So in that regard, I also want to thank Rising Voices for giving this avenue, this space, to not just the Native scholars and the Native scientists and Native practitioners, but to our allies, our allies in the responsible um, and participatory non-governmental organizations, university research centers who are finally waking up now and saying, listen, we need to do this differently in a relational manner where we equitably share the results we find. So thank you, Rising Voices, for leading the way there. And this is a program born of the conversations and the work in Rising Voices directly linked to the Indigenous Phonology Network. We want to take this opportunity to share with all of our first-time viewers of Rising Voices' efforts in Colorado and throughout the nation, and for that matter, the world, and how these collaborations can shape new possibilities and new programs. Thank you. Take it away, Chris. Audio. Security Project introduces Vic Tree Gardens, virtually interconnected community tree gardens. Emergency food for a family of four for four to six days in the event of a natural disaster. This is an expert guided, a DIY, a do it yourself, web based, internet community supported, self learning experience. Shelter in place, food in place, with your Victory Garden, your virtually interconnected community tree garden. Today, the city and county of Honolulu, and in fact, the entire state of Hawaii, imports over 80% of its food. But in truth, that figure is closer to 95% because the production of food that is grown here is almost entirely dependent upon imported fuel, imported fertilizer, imported chemicals. We are highly dependent upon a global distribution system that brings us our food and the means to grow food from faraway places. We are on tenuous life support, and climate change raises the stakes. This extreme dependency does not become obvious until an event strikes that interrupts the flow of goods in the global supply chain. We know such events are both natural and man-made. Here's our little papaya tree, and I just wanted to show it to you because in this garden there are so many different kinds of plants and they're all growing really close together in this 10 by 25 plot, right outside the kitchen. And in a state of emergency, we would have food for about four days, maybe. Hello, um, I'm Sage Nishida, and I'm working on the Includes project. Um, Where are we? Where are we? Love Farm. Where are we? Love Farm, right? We're at the Love Farm in... In Honoka'a. We've just been measuring out the area where we're going to put the gardens, the big like food forest. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
We're gonna put them, we're gonna put three right now, but maybe four. We haven't decided because there might be buildings, but we've just measured out the layout so we know how big the gardens are gonna be. And we just finished installing the soil moisture probes. There's four different depths, so we can get the different readings at different depths of how much moisture is in the soil. Um, we have 90, um, we have 60, 30, and 10 centimeters. Um, and then we're gonna come check these regularly and see what the moisture in the soil is like. Uh, my name is Cliff Naiole. No Maui Maiko Hana Paliku Vahe'e. Raised on this island of Maui near the cliffs of Vahe'e. And my grandfather, grandfather taught me a lesson when I was a child. You know, he said, there will be a time when the great Huli will come to these islands. And like the fingers, he says, the most important people on this earth will be the fisherman, the farmer, the hunter, the gatherer, and the medicine man. Mm. And he says, you look at the lima, all these fingers work together. If you put the lima down this way, you can always dig them hole, you can cuddle your seed, cover them up, you can pull out the crop. The only time you turn your head this way is to give to your family. Mm. So with that in mind, uh, we're just waiting for the great huli to come. And it's very important, I believe, that um, we give our people, not just the Hawaiian people, but the people of Hawaii, uh, a fair shake in having some type of self-sustenance in their yards, in their communities. And if you define the word community, you know what it's all about. It's still community associations. But to be able to have a plot of land where you can depend upon yourself to grow these things, so that when the Great Huli comes, at least we'll be prepared in a short sense and have that ability to depend upon each other because I may have this crop here my neighbor may have another one mm -hmm. and if we look at it like the types of the ahupua from before uh, that's what they did they all depended upon each other so why can't we do it in modern days food sovereignty for our people grow what the DNA of the land accepts hopefully politicians if you're out there listening uh, give us a chance to be self-sustainable and uh, it takes the pressure off of you, because when the Great Huli comes, mm. when the Great Huli comes, be responsible for all people. Let some of our people be responsible for themselves. I just wanted to reiterate that this is a 10 by 25 foot plot, and that every single family dwelling in Honolulu could have something just like this. This little section has a lot of endemic plants. There's the la'i, the ava, the how back there. Um, there's a little ohia tree that's waiting to go in the ground and the uala and the olena right here in the corner. There's endemic ferns behind me and if you look closely you'll see that this looks like a forest floor. It might look like chaos to the untrained eye but this is actually a collaboration between humans and what naturally occurs in the forest. Wow, has it really been a year since we've been at this garden? Look how much it's grown. The pigeon pea has exploded in this space. And this is the la'i that I showed you last time. It's almost as tall as I am. The olena is doing really well here. Welcome back to the garden. You can see things have been growing everywhere, here, here with us, everywhere. So we've added breadfruit. These are in pots. We're using it as a little nursery as the trees are getting ready to go in the ground. But we do have one that I'll show you in a bit that's in the ground here. Look how big the taro is. I think we're going to pull this one soon. And the ava is really shooting up now that there's more space. We took the pigeon pea out. Things are evolving. Our old friend, definitely taller than me now. Hey everybody, we're back at the garden and we're here to see what time has done to it. The fourth dimension. So, the tall la'i, it's getting big. And back over here, my little Apu is with me. So there's one thing we hadn't mentioned before about this art altar here. 
When we built this altar, we built them with stones from the ocean with coral deposits on the surfaces, as you can see. And as the water travels over them, it washes all the minerals into the earth over time. So this is the high point of this 10 by 25 garden. And we're slowly adding the minerals back into the soil. He sometimes likes to help me mulch. He likes to break the tea leaves off and we put them under the plants. As you can see there, piles of the leaves trying to keep all the moisture in here. It's been really dry. He loves the pigeon peas. Mm. <laughs> the breadfruit tree over here is taking off. Papayas look amazing. Thanks everybody, welcome back. That was a beautiful video from the Victory Gardens and I wish that I were there right now. Um, I hope that uh, you all had your, a great time in your various phenology adventures. Apologies for the technological speed bumps. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, while we're still waiting for everybody to come back together here watching the YouTube channel, I do want to share um, an important note we um, take evaluation of all of these activities very um, importantly. And so we, um, we've taken the consideration of from the evaluations of the April kickoff event into account. And um, now, as you see, we're moving into different formats for these more engaged uh, webinars, which will improve as we uh, iron out those speed bumps and understand uh, the nuances of all of our technologies. Um, but we really ask that you please do complete the new evaluation survey of today's activity and event, because that will help us in the future as well. That will help us for next month and the month after that. And each month we will build on the evaluation that we get back. Um, the links to the evaluation, a very short survey, which won't take much of your time, but will help us a great deal, will be both in the YouTube chat box and will be emailed to the Rising Voices and the IPN Indigenous Phenology Network listservs immediately following this event. So we do hope again that you will please um, provide some feedback on that and unsolicited feedback that doesn't respond to a specific question in the survey um, is also very welcome if you have uh, suggestions or thoughts for us, we welcome that. Um, in our last few remaining moments, we want very, very brief breakout session, uh, report backs from each of the breakout sessions. I think from here, we're going to Katie. Oh, shall I continue? Okay, hang on. Oh, okay. Is it me? Sorry. <laughs> Go. Um, okay. Um, well, being super brief, um, one of the things that really stood out to me was um, we've, we've got, we had a number of both indigenous and non-indigenous um, people in academic environments that are really taking steps to put um, indigenous knowledge and you know, non-Western knowledge systems to the, in the forefront in, in some of their work. Um, and I think that it's, awesome to hear that that's coming from both directions, that it's not just the indigenous scholars that are saying, hey, this is important, but it's also our non-indigenous who are putting a, a spotlight on indigenous knowledge when it's used, making sure there's credit given, um, and also incorporating it um, in, a, in a way that's on equal footing with the uh, Western knowledge systems. Um, we had, there was a lot of focus on uh, storytelling and uh, the role of, um, of storytelling and passing knowledge on and how that can be um, brought into Western um, studies. 
Um, and I think that we, we didn't come to any new projects, um, but I feel like we really got to know um, a lot of people in the room and I'm super excited to see where we can uh, start. We made connections. I think we can start building projects here soon. Um, and now back to Heather. Oh, to Julie, sorry. I think it is to me. Oh. <laughs> At this point, Julie and I have swapped identities so much over the last hour and a half, I barely know which of us is which. Um, I was able to be part of the discussion that was held over in the parallel universe of Google Meets. And so I will just report briefly back some of that terrific uh, conversation. Um, we sort of started off with a question that I would like all of us to consider. I think it's, it's interesting. What local observations um, can we correlate with some of the regional and global scale observations that we're hearing about diminished, uh, about diminished greenhouse gas emissions during the last two to three months? So how is local phenology changing alongside these regional and global trends that we're seeing? And I think that would be a really fascinating thing to, to keep all of our eyes on. Um, we talked about native approaches to ecosystem services uh, being uh, relational and where giving before taking is emphasized, um, treating the, the ecosystem as a huge group of relatives um, and this being vital to sustainably managing our behaviors around the resources that are really our true lifelines, particularly uh, in the context of food. And some of us are eating more locally, um, supporting more local food efforts. And how do we think about that in the context of phenology as well? Um, what do we hold on to when our dominant colonial settlers, settler structures and systems try to come back? So, you know, what food, how can we maintain those food systems um, is, that we can think about, especially in the, in the context of phenology, when sort of the business as usual and back to normal starts to come back? What can we hang on to going forward? Uh, we talked about mutual aid, new approaches to infrastructure that are less energy intensive um, in buildings and transportation, again, in food systems. We talked about intergenerational knowledge, the importance of having really different perspectives, whether they be indigenous, generational, or both, uh, that allow us to think about options to these dominant structures. Um, we talked about a toolkit. How do, we use, how do we do this work and share these ideas? And I think, uh, you know, the platform the existing platform of the IPN is a hugely uh, beneficial and productive way of doing that. And then finally, um, our collaborative action, let's all go plant a tree. And that's it from that group. Thanks. Hey everyone. Um, I know we are uh, going a bit over here and the East Coasters are on to dinner hour or so. Um, so we um, are gonna, Wrap up here in just a moment. Just a huge thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, while I know um, the breakout seemed really short, um, you know the the idea behind this today was to you know have this connection point with with some old friends and then also new uh, new folks coming together. And it was really exciting to you know hear a lot of new folks um, at least having an initial get uh, meeting together. And what we're going to do is you know be collecting the notes from today compiling things together and you know wow we didn't have enough time in these sessions um to really um you know dive deep into building um you know and growing our collaborations this was um kind of part of that planting a seed to continue to do so and so um we will continue to water it together and to grow and to um, combine our efforts in collaborative efforts that we really need um more now than ever um, possibly. And so thank you for being part of this journey um, for your patience in the technology. The good thing is we now know what happened. So we know um, how to improve that the next go around. Um, we will uh, get the best of the, the Zoom the Zoom beasts um, out of our out of our webs. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, Next month, we will be having the community relocation uh, site expansion group. So there will be um, another recorded uh, session from there. And then we will having a, have a working group session together. And please, please do fill out the evaluation forms Paulette shared on the YouTube stream. I'll also um, send it out to the listservs just after this. Um, and because that's even if you filled it out the last time, that's really important because this is the first time we're doing something in this kind of format. And it'll really help us shape what 
how we can do better and improve for this whole community as a collective in the coming months. And so hope this finds everyone in good health um, and well-being. And we look forward very much to seeing you the next time around. Um, and with that, I think we will hand it over to Kalani and Hank to close us out. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks again, you guys. Fabulous job as always. And you know, the complaint is not enough time to get everything done. You know, as an old school facilitator, we always learn it's not facilitation until you move the furniture. You know, but aside <laughs> yeah. from that, yeah. in a badly facilitated meeting, you cannot pay people to stay. But in a good facilitated meeting, people always feel like they ran out of time. So, you know, so must be I'm thinking right. this is a, as a pretty good initial eval if we think we're getting together, but we don't have enough time to get all the work done. So it means the relationships are important. We got a few more months to get this methodology right and to share the information and the capacity. We want to thank you all for joining us on VRV8, vervading our way out and rising voices. Hank, I want to give the old guy in the room the chance to <laughs> oh, have the last word. <clears throat> e iho ano luna, e pi ano lalo, e hui ano na moku, e ku ano kapaya. This is the prophecy chant that talks about this time right now, the huli. So it was, call your ancestors from above and those from below. We'll all gather together, we'll lock arms, and we'll raise a nation. Raise the globe. Raise our families. <clears throat> raise your hands in celebration. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you guys in the next RV. <laughs> Blessings on us all. Chris, take us home, baby. <laughs> Alarm bell rings, same thing every day. Well, that's the phone. I'm not home. I'm already on my way. I'm the low down the street. Got to keep me on my feet. I got coffee. I got donuts in the office down the street. And the fat hat lady's faking a heart attack. And my manager yelling at me, say, can't give her her money back. Then I call the notice overdue. And that's just one more thing I gotta do. Did I get off the earth? Did I get off the earth? Twelve o'clock, the lunch bell rings. Same thing every day. You better answer the phone in the proper tone. Yes, sir, whatever you say. Right on time, on the time. You got to keep me on my feet. I got contracts. I got lawyers. In the office, down the street. Thank you. Damn, it's backing up more than I can stand. Things ain't working out the way I had them planned. Hang on the meeting, just a drink or two. That's just one more thing I gotta do. Did I get off the earth? Did I get off the earth? Did I get off the earth? Flashing into view, and it's just one more thing I gotta do.